evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of AJAC Live Online. My name is Joel Burney, and it's fantastic to have you with us tonight. A special mention to our Facebook streaming audience and our international guests who have been able to join us tonight. We thank you for being available with us. We're looking forward to tonight's webinar. A quick flip to our guest of honor, Mike, how are you? Good, mate. Uh, great to be with you all tonight. I hope you all had a great Pesach with family and friends. Great to have you with us tonight. We're looking forward. There's a lot to cover and uh, I'm looking forward to the presentation as well as the question and answer session too. Now, ladies and gentlemen, very short housekeeping as usual. Our next webinar will be with former US Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs and now Senior Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, David Schenker. David will present in a morning briefing, a first for AJAC Live Online, it will be on Wednesday, the 28th of April at 8 a.m. And the registration for this webinar is currently open now. So you would have received an invitation about a week ago. A reminder invitation will come out uh, sometime later on this week. So that's David Schenker, 8 a.m. Wednesday, the 28th of April, not to be missed. As usual, we will be facilitating a question and answer session uh, during tonight's webinar, I'll go through the instructions of how to facilitate that through Zoom a little bit later on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to our main event. Dr. Mike Kelly served as a Member of Parliament from 2007 to 2013, and again from 2016 until 2020. He held several executive positions in the Rudd and Gillard governments, including serving as Minister for Defence Material in 2013, Assistant Shadow Minister for Defence Industry, and member of the Shadow and National Security Committee. He also sat on the Parliamentary Joint Committee of, on Intelligence and Security. Before entering Parliament, Mike served in the Australian Army for 20 years. During this time, he was deployed to international operations in Somalia, Bosnia, East Timor, Iraq, and a hostage recovery mission in Kenya. He was awarded the Chief of the General Staff Commendation in 1993, made a member of the Order of Australia in the Military Division in 1994, and received the United Nations Force Commander's Commendation in 2002. He was recently appointed President of Palantir Australia, and he leads the Australian operations of Palantir Technologies. Now, after that very long and distinguished bio, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's topic is assessing the strategic relationship between Australia and Israel, an insider's view. It is now my pleasure to hand over to AJAC's Executive Director, Dr. Colin Rubenstein, to say a few words. Thanks very much, Joel. And uh, it's truly a great pleasure to welcome you all back and particularly to welcome our highly respected and very formidable guest of honor tonight, Dr. Mike Kelly. On top of all the other attributes Joel's correctly mentioned, I have to point out that Mike has been a great friend of our community in Israel, and uh, he's participated in just about all of the Australia-Israel Besheva dialogues, the strategic dialogues that AJAC was instrumental in starting uh, bet between uh, ASPE, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, and uh, Kindred Institutes in Israel over the years. A very important uh, dialogue uh, that will be continuing and re really go to the cutting edge of the possibility of enhancing the strategic relationships between Australia and Israel. Now, we're meeting tonight at a time uh, of great uh, delicacy and perhaps escalation in the Middle East. Um, what's going on in the Australia-Israel relationship? Well, you know, we have in Israel right now, the US Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, uh, canvassing a whole range of issues, uh, certainly discussing the fraught Iran nuclear deal and the efforts uh, of the United States and the other members of, of the JCPOA to revisit it and perhaps uh, rewrite it and to re-enter it uh, on the US's behalf. Uh, of course, on, on the Israeli side, on the critic side, uh, the flaws of that deal uh, are very well known. The, the, the sunset clause, for example, uh, means it was only a delay uh, towards Iran achieving nuclear weapons capability and not putting an end to it. Uh, the fact that its missile production went held for leather and its uh, nefarious activities throughout the region uh, continued. Uh, 
uh, are all problematic uh, issues in that deal. And we've seen a little bit of action uh, in the last few days uh, where Iran, of course, is openly flouting the deal in a, in a game of uh, chicken uh, with the US and, and the other key uh, players here in terms of negotiations currently going on in Vienna. Israel has made it very clear that uh, it will not allow Iran to achieve that nuclear weapons capability, whatever the status of that deal. So these talks between the US Secretary of Defense um, in Israel right now are extremely important. They're important on another front too, in terms of uh, the US re-engaging with the Palestinians somewhat unconditionally, providing aid, re-entering UNRWA, uh, opening contacts, uh, contacts in a way that some feel may be counterproductive and a little misguided. So uh, things are happening. And in that context, uh, what's happening on the Australian front? And we know the Australian government has been very supportive, very supportive of Israel and the UN agencies, supportive of the path-breaking historic Abraham Accords uh, and so on. A little weaker in the area of Iran and Hezbollah. And of course, we turn to, to Labor with a strong history of support for Israel, but we also know there's a faction there that are highly critical. And we saw the national conference very recently. Again, positive initiatives, as Joel's mentioned, with resolutions on Iran and Hezbollah, didn't go far enough, incomplete, but at least uh, they're not a bad sign. But on the other hand, of course, there is concern about the high priority given for unconditional unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state by a future Labor government. Although we're reassured by the leadership that it won't be binding on the government, even though it's now in the platform. So what's the truth here? There are a lot of issues. There are a lot of questions on the agenda. I've just touched on a few of them. And actually, we can't think of anyone better in Australia that to give us some sort of guide and provide some sort of enlightenment on these tricky issues than our very distinguished guest of honour tonight, Mike Kelly. Mike, the screen is yours. Well, thanks very much, Colin. It's a great pleasure to uh, hear from you. Of course, you've uh, been a great mate over the years and done such lion's work for the relationship between Australia and Israel. And um, it is interesting to have put to me this question of assessing the strategic relationships because if you talk to the broader Australian community, uh, their question would be, well, why? Why would there be a, a strategic relationship? And uh, certainly when you think in terms of strategic relationships, that has to be underpinned or analysed in the context of the intersection of strategic interests. So then again, you would say, well, you know, we're at opposite ends of the globe. How does that work? Uh, but in reality, a lot of Australians, I don't think, are as familiar with our history in that respect and that regular intersection that has occurred over the many, many decades of the last century through, through this century. Uh, in particular, my own family, as you can see over my shoulder there, a picture of uh, members of the family in the Australian Light Horse. So I had members of my family in, in what was called Palestine at the time uh, during the First World War. And uh, of course, we were back there again in the Second World War. And again, members of my family were serving there and uh, were being in both world wars very well looked after by members of the Yeshua provided with welfare support and great encouragement from those communities. The intersection strategically at that time was of course, we were operating within the context of the, the British Empire stroke Commonwealth construct. And of course the Suez Canal was a very critical part of that global family and relationship. Uh, these days, of course, uh, the strategic interests would uh, be more defined by, I think, some of the globalised threats that we face and the virtual threats that we face, and I'll come back to those. But uh, interestingly too, all through that period post Second World War, the Australian presence was, has been permanent in the region through the multinational force of observers in the Sinai and through the uh, personnel that we have always contributed to UNSO and UN monitoring organisations in the Middle East. And then, of course, we returned during the Gulf Wars and the roles that Australians played uh, during the Gulf Wars were critical, uh, for example, in preventing scud launches from Western Iraq to Israel. Uh, and of course, uh, we have maintained uh, a keen interest in the security of the global interests that are involved in uh, preserving the traffic of uh, key vital strategic resources like oil through the Middle East. And, the threat that countries like Iran have posed uh, to those resources. And of course, 
during the 70s, if you're looking at economic security, uh, we suffered as much as anybody else in relation to the oil shocks of 73 and then 79 and through into 80 with the uh, conflict and disruptions in the region. More recent times, of course, we face the mutual th threat of uh, terrorism and uh, that have, has, of course, been mainly focused on uh, Islamist extremism in recent years. Uh, and uh, those threats have become more and more sophisticated. Uh, they are resorting more and more to the tools of the virtual th threat space that I mentioned in terms of encrypted communications and grooming of recruits and uh, deploying those against uh, our citizens. Uh, a, person, a person may be located as they were sitting in Rafa in, uh, in Syria, uh, recruiting an Australian in Sydney or Melbourne to go and commit a terrorist act. So uh, the nature of the globalizing threat and the technology underpinning that is something that we have a mutual interest in tackling. Uh, of course, in recent times too, we've seen the dramatic rise of violent uh, right-wing extremism. And uh, that right-wing extremism is as much uh, anathema to our democratic way of life as it is a, an existential threat to, uh, to the Jewish community as they quite often underpin their ideology with virulent anti-Semitism, adopting the ideologies of the Nazis quite openly in many respects. So uh, we have these two pronged terrorist threats in recent times that have uh, uh, required a lot of cooperation internationally and that cooperation has been no less prominent in the dealings between Australia and Israel in sharing information. And in fact, there had been some critical information passed from Israel to Australia to defeat specific terrorist plots and threats in Australia. So that has been a very strong part of our relationship. Um, I guess you could also look at uh, some of the technical cooperation that we have had. And I was very pleased when I was uh, uh, in government uh, to have uh, advanced that quite significantly. We had the uh, Typhoon weapon systems on our vessels already, but uh, we were able to then uh, encourage uh, Elbit to provide us with uh, battlefield management systems options. And we entered into a very large contract with Elbit and they're still here, set up in Australia, become a great Australian based company, in fact, um, cr creating a tremendous technical skills base for this country in their uh, Australian-based operations here, continuing to provide uh, wonderful support in those networking and battlefield management space uh, aspects. Again, uh, when I look at the development of the Hawkeye uh, Light Tactical uh, Protected Mobility Vehicle, which I was very, very strong in advocating when we were in government. Uh, and in order to make that happen, I, I visited uh, Plassen in uh, Kibbutz Plassen, Sasser in, uh, in Israel, uh, who do wonderful technology in that force protection space. Teaming them up with Talos here in Australia has produced what I believe is the best tactical protected mobility vehicle in the world at the present time and will serve us extremely well in many different circumstances. Uh, we will also obtaining helmets and battlefield uh, combat bandages from Israel at that time as well for Afghanistan. Uh, and eventually we, during our time in government, deployed the Israeli Heron uh, remotely piloted vehicles into Afghanistan, which gave us a quantum improvement in, in our operational capabilities in Afghanistan uh, from many aspects, mainly from the point of view of intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, but in particular in the sophistication uh, that has been evolved in de detection of uh, improvised explosive devices. So those herons were playing a very, very important role in keeping Australians safe uh, from those types of attacks. So technically and tactically, we've been cooperating on, on levels as well as the strategic level. But now, of course, um, I guess in our region, we're facing uh, escalating threats from China under Xi Jinping have become much more aggressive. We've always had that disabling presence of the behavior of North Korea uh, in our region as well. And there's uh, increasing concerns about uh, Russian aggression as well, mainly in those uh, virtual spaces, threat spaces that I mentioned, and I'll come back to that. Uh, but when we talk about China and North Korea, of course, North Korea plays directly into specific threats to Israel as well as uh, to Australia in our region. 
Uh, they have cooperated <coughs> over many years, going back to particularly 1979, 80, with Iran and uh, Syria in improving their missile capabilities and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, potentially in their nuclear capabilities as well. Uh, so we've had a mutual interest in how we address the North Korean threat. Uh, Iran, of course, maintains uh, an approach to foreign policy, if you like, uh, that involves not only uh, operating a substantial conventional threat against the Straits of Hormuz, um, and also, of course, in their conventional military capabilities and missile capabilities. But as we know, they uh, have they initiated... Uh, developed, supported, supplied, commanded uh, the significant Hezbollah capability in Lebanon. And uh, that, of course, has been an extreme threat to Israel uh, and has played out that way on many occasions. In fact, in 2006, uh, when Israel was uh, really focused on trying to neutralise those missile threats emerging from Hezbollah in the, the operations conducted in that year, uh, we discovered we had something like 25,000 Australian citizens sitting in Lebanon. And I was actually in strategy group in defence at the time and was thrown at that task force to try and deal with that situation. And what I did was deploy our, uh, our attache from Rome into Israel, into Tel Aviv. And uh, we also used uh, an attache to get into Lebanon and uh, also deployed an officer into Turkey to help manage that evacuation, but it was coordinated extremely effectively with Israel. Uh, the movements of Australian citizens to get them to ports and evacuation sites was done very closely with Israel. So that strategic uh, intersection can be in many places on the globe, as, as many Australians may not appreciate, but I, I didn't, don't think we appreciated we had 25,000 citizens sitting in Lebanon at the time of that uh, conflict. Uh, of course, uh, the, the morphing now of, of that threat uh, from Hezbollah has become also very challenging and threatening, and it has really highlighted the, the problem that we deal with in terms of counterterrorism financing and terrorism, the, the, the financial resources that terrorists have managed to glean for themselves. And this is a major international concern. Uh, we have, as you know, reported recently something like 25 million violations of uh, our anti-money laundering um, regulations uh, for some of our major banks associated partly too with, counter with the terrorism financing issue. And Hezbollah has become very sophisticated at that. And uh, a lot of their earnings, for example, come from their close relationship with South American drug lords. So this is an international, transnational criminal uh, threat to all of our countries. And, uh, and this was something that I think the US was not entirely on top of as Israel was. And it took a lot of effort from Israel to draw attention to this being a Department of Justice issue as much as uh, a Pentagon issue. And through Operation Harpoon, Israel, I think, has taught the world uh, how you must go about choking off these threats in terms of their financial sinews of war, if you like. Uh, so we need to be much more closely aligned and in conversation with Israel about how we uh, choke the terrorism financing off and the various forms which they use to achieve it. Um, but of, of course now with, with these escalation of threats from China under Xi Jinping and, and Russia, there is, I think, uh, quite a bit of intersection of interest there as well. And one of them relates to economic security. So uh, Israel, of course, for a long time was really challenged from an energy perspective. Uh, they've been in much better shape recently with things like the Tamar and Leviathan uh, gas field developments, but they are finite. You know, there's various estimates they may only last 37 years. Um, and Israel, of course, continues to be dependent on imports of foreign oil for their transport sector. Uh, but the government in Israel has specified that they are determined to get off their dependence on uh, oil for road transportation sector by 2030. Uh, conversely, Australia, which produces oil, doesn't produce refined oil. Uh, and then you've noticed the closing of refineries in recent times in Australia, which has us uh, on track uh, to be 100% reliant on uh, imported petroleum by 2030. So on the one hand, you've got Israel setting a marker of 2030 to have themselves independent of oil. On the other hand, you've got Australia hitting by 2030, 
complete dependence on foreign oil. And with the tensions you have in the South China Sea, the vulnerability strategically we have to imported oil across our sea lanes, it is in both our interests to collaborate on achieving energy security, particularly in relation to terminating our dependence on oil. The, the extra benefit of that from a security point of view is that when I was in Defence Strategy Group in the Middle East desk, I tracked billions of dollars that came into our region from even just wealthy oil individuals from the Middle East, funding radical madrasas and terrorist movements in our region. And we all know that we've lost a lot of Australians to terrorist attacks, particularly in the uh, Sari Club bombing in Bali. Uh, so it is in our interest to choke off the, the sinews to the support that goes to those terrorist groups through oil money at the same time. So we should get off this stuff as quickly as possible. I would love to see Australia and Israel cooperate technically more closely on things like our uh, hydrogen program. I would love to see um, some Israeli relevant organisation partnering up with the Australian Hydrogen Strategy Group uh, to get us there as quickly as possible and other forms of uh, developing energy security strategies. Uh, technically speaking, of course, with this cyber and data challenge, I won't go into detail now on the threat from Russia, but it is massive. They are, in fact, very much behind the networking, facilitating and mobilising of these extreme right wing groups. And their line of operation that they are pursuing under their active measures policy is to undermine liberal democracy in general. And to do that, they have been very keen to pit right wing against left wing groups, uh, but particularly mobilising these right wing groups. They have targeted uh, serving personnel and military veterans groups and police particularly. And we've seen some of that play out dramatically recently. And I've seen it on my own line uh, feeds and Facebook with groups that plug me in as a veteran and uh, became very concerning. And, uh, and I tried to weigh in at one point and was shut out of that group within a nanosecond. But a lot of this stuff is orchestrated by Russian intelligence. Uh, for example, the Veterans for Trump's group the Trump group was actually operated out of Macedonia. Um, so uh, between the facilities they have in St. Petersburg and the Special Technology Centre, the Internet Research Agency, uh, their bot factories, the way they amplify their efforts through uh, criminal gangs in Eastern Europe, all operating to the uh, GRU and to some extent foreign intelligence services. Uh, this is a, a really serious threat that requires collaboration from all of us at the moment. Uh, so I would love us to work more closely on, uh, on meeting that cyber threat with Israel. Uh, one stat that really brings it home though is that in the three months of the US 2016 election campaign leading up to uh, uh, election day, there was something like in terms of the false content campaign, there were about 38 million shares on Facebook promoted by this Russian operation, which resulted in uh, 760 million clicks. Uh, so you're talking about three stories per read uh, per American. So uh, this is the scale of the, the challenge we're facing. Um, I would love us to, to look at how we would deal with the rise and potential benefit and threat of quantum computing. Quantum computing will be a massive game changer across the security landscape. And uh, it's very important that we're ahead of that curve. China is investing massive resources to try and be the first to that and uh, we need to be there before them, frankly. Um, and I won't say more about that. It's a very complicated technical area, but we are doing some great stuff here in Australia and I would love us to collaborate more closely with Israel on meeting that challenge. And lastly, uh, we were all worried about, of course, the 5G issue and um, the issue of Huawei and Australia quite rightly determined not to use it as the Labor government determined not to use Huawei in the NBN project. Uh, the, the thing is though, 5G has been very popular out there in terms of how Huawei support uh, being cheaper, technically good and business, the business world loves that stuff. Uh, cheap and technically good is great for business. What we need to do is collaborate between Australia, Israel and the US perhaps and others. We're interested in leapfrogging 5G to 6G, making sure that our networks are secure in the future because with the internet of things and the extreme networking of every single aspect of our infrastructure and society these days, uh, this is an incredible vulnerability if we don't get it right. And Russia and America, for example, are in a bit of an arms race at the moment to see who can bring down each other's grid the fastest. 
uh, it's effectively the non-nuclear nuclear option. Uh, so I would love to see greater cooperation between Australia and Israel uh, in relation to those aspects. So look, that's a, a bit of a, 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 I guess, a headland sort of scoping of uh, some of the issues out there I see in the relationship and the intersection of interests. Uh, there's a lot more that could be said, particularly concerning to see China and Iran have signed a comprehensive uh, strategic partnership agreement just on the 28th of March, only a few days ago. Uh, so there's a lot to be alert to and alive to. And with a new US administration, we've both got to work hard on bringing them along uh, on the, uh, the right track with this stuff. Uh, and as Colin mentioned, particularly in relation to Iran's nuclear ambitions. So I'll leave it there and uh, just uh, open it up for uh, questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that, Mike. There's a lot there to unpack. Ladies and gentlemen, the Q&A can be facilitated through Zoom. There is a button at the bottom of your screen. It says reactions. If you hit that, you'll have a raised hand feature. It will provide an indication to me of your intent to ask a question. You can also use the chat if you're a little bit camera shy, uh, but it's best if we can ask Mike a question directly. And we now have the great usage of what I believe is a split screen. So uh, it's all new and happening here at Ajax Live Online. So the first question will go to uh, Ajax Oved Lebel. Just unmute yourself there. Hi, yeah, uh, sorry. Thanks, Mike, for doing this. Can... All right, all technical issues resolved. Um... Yeah, I wanted, so I wanted to know, so you were deeply involved in Iraq in 2003 and onward. So um, how do you assess what's going on there right now and what the US and its allies should be doing? Yeah, thanks very much for the question, Ovid. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important one because uh, Iraq has uh, so much uh, relevance to our overall all position within the Middle East. And uh, there was so much potential coming out of uh, the Iraq war to uh, to do a better job of setting the, the political parameters up for something that would be much more, uh, I think, useful to the, the overall future of Iraqis as well as our strategic objectives. The interesting thing about going to Iraq was that um, we really blew that play going back to the first Gulf War uh, when we told the Iraqis to rise up and uh, and then we just sat back and watched them get absolutely slaughtered in their thousands by Saddam Hussein and didn't lift a finger to do anything about it. Uh, so when I deployed in there and I spent a lot of time on the ground with Iraqis uh, all over the country and they all asked us, you know, why the hell did you call us to rise up and then just abandon us, you know? And uh, I visited many, many mass grave sites in Iraq. I think the one in near Hilla that I visited had 10,000 bodies in it, just that one mass grave. So you can appreciate the scale of what happened to them. So they were very suspicious about our intentions coming in the second time around, uh, nowhere near as sort of uh, open armed and spreading. And when the potential of the last time would have been, they would have been so grateful to see us and keen for their, us to help them. And then you had the oil for food program, which ruined every aspect of their economy over the years uh, and became a vehicle for massive levels of corruption. And not only in Iraq, uh, but also within the UN and it even wrapped up, as you know, the Australian Wheat Board. Um, so we, when we got in there, we found just a massive disintegration of Iraqi infrastructure. Uh, and there was a huge oil smuggling regime that was going on that was bleeding the country dry. And one of my jobs actually in there was to end that oil smuggling regime. But we, we failed miserably to identify the, the, the very necessary strategies we needed to pursue to eliminate insurgency and, and, uh, and put the country on a steady track. So it took many, many months of terrible mistakes and thousands and thousands of lost lives before the strategy started changing from the military perspective, particularly with people like General Petraeus uh, and working off the back of the good work on doctrine that General Mattis did. Um, but we failed to tie that successful military strategy from you know, 2006, seven onwards to a sound political strategy. And, you know, Maliki with his highly sectarian approach to uh, his running of, of Iraq really alienated uh, so many elements of society. 
and uh, really undermined faith in the democratic processes and, uh, and then effectively left fertile ground by undermining the army, weakening it significantly through corruption so that it was easy pickings for ISIS. Um, now, of course, you know, uh, we've got a second go around at having to rebuild, um, but unless we effectively engage politically there, and of course in the Middle East, engaging politically and diplomatically has always got to be around an incentive-based regime as we've seen with the Abraham Accords. Uh, so um, obviously that has to be crafted carefully, but it is very important. Uh, it can be a, a positive player for stability, but we have to understand the cultural aspects of that before we go sticking our noses in, um, not understanding, for example, how, how important Ali al-Sistani, the Grand Ayatollah, was in Iraq and how we could have used him and how he would have supported us in our efforts uh, was really fatal. So um, there's so, so much recalibration that has to be undertaken. And I think the Biden administration is definitely going to have its hands full. But right now, um, the serious, more serious threat that we face is coming from Iran, of course. Thank you for that, Mike. I'll now like to hand over to Peter Wertheim. Good evening, Mike. It's always great to hear from you. And thank you, by the way, Jack, for uh, inviting you on. Uh, Mike, uh, my question relates to um, something that Colin touched on his, in his introduction, namely the recent uh, ALP National Platform Conference, where the uh, call uh, for a new uh, next Labor government to recognise the state of Palestine was elevated from a resolution to um, something in the draft, something in the platform. Um, now, just putting to one side all the arcane um, rules about the significance of that, the difference between a resolution and a platform policy. I'm going to ask you, if, if you don't mind, just to look into your crystal ball and uh, assuming that nothing dramatic changes on the ground, which is probably a, a fraught assumption uh, with regard to the Middle East at, at the best of times. But assuming that there's, you know, things stay essentially the same, uh, what is your estimate of the chances that uh, the next Labor government will actually recognise uh, a state of Palestine outside of any agreement with Israel? And as a second part to that question, if Hamas should win the upcoming Palestinian legislative and presidential elections, assuming that those elections actually go ahead. Uh, do you think that that would alter the ALP's attitude towards unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state? And I guess just to, to, to wrap up that aspect, if you wouldn't mind perhaps giving us a, an assessment of uh, how the ALP compares to other social democratic movements in other parts of the world with regard to this attitude towards recognition and the way it's evolved in Australia since that incident where Julia Gillard was threatened to be rolled by um, federal ALP members back in 2012 when the issue of recognition came up in the UN General Assembly uh, and all the resolutions that have been passed at state and federal conferences since. Um, sorry to, you know, to wrap it all up in such a big ball, but yeah, uh, it's the only way I could think of doing it. <laughs> no, it's been a, um, really good to hear from you, Peter, as well. And um, yeah, it's obviously been a, a subject that I've had a lot to do with over the years in both state conference and federal conference contexts. Um, so I guess to start with, what does it mean now effectively? And then what does it mean when we have a, a federal Labor government again? Um, firstly, you know, we do recognise that the wording is not different from the 2018 National Conference uh, resolution. Uh, so if you recall, at the time of that conference, uh, I wrote a lengthy piece for the uh, AJN, uh, which was fully coordinated with and understood by Penny Wong, who was Shadow Foreign Minister at that time too. And so the understanding of the wording of that was that uh, it was one of the ambitions within the concept of the two-state solution uh, that obviously naturally presumes there will be a, a Palestinian state if we're having a two-state solution. The question is when and how and, and should that take place? And you'll recall I spelled out a number of considerations that would definitely form part of making that decision. 
and that Penny Wong fully acknowledged, you know, there would be a range of things to consider. And that will depend upon the time at which uh, that might be worth considering, you know, like when we're in government, for example, if you're the Labor in the Labor Party. Um, but some of those considerations would be, has there been free and fair elections, which we know there haven't been for a long time. And uh, one of the things that, that I did in our strategy group was uh, convince the Howard government to allow me to deploy an, an army lieutenant colonel to General uh, Ward's team, US General Ward's team, working with the Palestinian Authority at the time to build an efficacious security sector. And there was a lot of great work that had been going on at that period. You know, we were building all of the, I guess, uh, the institutions of a state, a Palestinian state, hopefully being in the model that we would be comfortable with, uh, with uh, uh, a sound division of uh, separation of powers between judiciary, political spheres, et cetera, police force that was uh, operating, operating efficaciously and all of these things. So that was all well and good, but I only got to deploy one officer because the second time around, uh, when we were about to deploy it, Hamas took over the Gaza Strip. And of course, if you're a social democratic party or if you're any democratic party, you know, as a liberal democracy, you would have to be concerned about supporting statehood for any entity that was completely opposed to elections most of the time. Uh, we don't still don't know if Hamas is actually committed to being involved in an election. Frankly, that's going to be free and fair. Um, but leaving that to one side, you see the fact that no free free trade unionism is allowed in the Gaza Strip. Uh, you see the fact that they uh, are, and in fact the the um, Human Rights Watch report of 2018 highlighted systematic torture, oppression. Uh, the prevention of freedom of speech, uh, repression of political opposition, not only in the Gaza Strip, but also within the areas of the Palestinian Authority. Routine resort to the death penalty in dubious circumstances, uh, the routine execution of gay and lesbian men and women in the Gaza Strip. Uh, you, you've got basically the uh, mistreatment uh, and denial of rights to women. Uh, so there's been, you know, a lot of reasons why you would want to say, okay, uh, if we are going to recognise a state, we would want to set some preconditions to that. Being a, you know, a liberal democratic, social democratic party, you would want to see certain things improved. Uh, you would use your diplomatic leverage for that recognition to achieve better outcomes. No one who's got any professional uh, understanding of foreign affairs gives away anything like uh, as significant as a recognition of a state for nothing. There has to be some uh, use of that leverage to achieve better outcomes, be they better outcomes for the Palestinian people, which is essentially what we're talking about here, who are being thoroughly abused by their leadership, uh, frankly. Uh, so we would want to use that diplomatically as leverage to achieve a better outcome for Palestinians, but also uh, it, you can't come in there doing a unilateral recognition in the context of disrupting a, a peace process. You know, this essentially it has to be acknowledged that this has got to be resolved between the parties within the context of a process and also in consultation with the quartet and our key diplomatic partners internationally. So that is all well understood by someone like a, a Penny Wong, I know. So the question is, that wording hasn't changed. I'm assuming um, that the fact that there'd be a number of considerations that would have to be taken into account before recognition was to take place uh, in the context of any broader diplomatic leverage or pressure that might need to be put, put in place at the time. The question is then, um, for the future, uh, what happens? So. You are right to say it's arcane, the difference between a resolution and being in the platform. I think the people that were concerned about it going into the platform uh, were more concerned that it stood out, stood out in our foreign policy statement. Effectively, your platform normally is about a general statement of principles. So some people were concerned that this was a, a focused, singled out element of policy that was spelled out there that looked very odd in the context of Australia's broader strategic goals. 
Um, so I'll leave that to others to, to judge as I'm not in that uh, the parliamentary context anymore. But if Labor was to form government, there is no doubt, you know, we've seen the pressure from quarters of the Labor Party to, you know, just move ahead without engaging in those processes of analysing considerations and, and the diplomatic context. Uh, there would certainly be quite a significant effort by, uh, I guess, the like-minded groups within the Labor Party to ensure that those considerations and that process was the priority in making that decision. But I would, I would venture to suggest too that uh, any Labor or Liberal foreign minister uh, in the context of that recognition would be under enormous pressure from allies and from the, uh, from the, the framework of the process itself to, to take a more considered approach to it than just simply rushing out to recognise a Palestinian state, no matter what the circumstances. And the fact remains, as things stand today, that legally speaking, there couldn't be a Palestinian state because you do not have one government that can represent the interests of the Palestinian people and participate in international relations and, uh, and sign up to international instruments. Uh, so that's got to be resolved before you go anywhere else. So um, these things remain to be seen from whenever there is a, a Labor government, but whether it's Labor or Liberal, you're going to have to have uh, you know, a process that takes into account being part of the real world and um, in real alliances and relationships globally. Um, so I think there will be constraints. Uh, I really, you know, social democratic parties around the world, um, how they will perceive these things, I think is largely now being reshaped by the Abraham Accords process. Uh, and I think that was the one positive outcome from the Trump period, from, my, from as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I don't think actually that was necessarily a lot to do with Trump himself. There was some uh, very astute inclusion of incentives uh, to those states combined with Israel's long-standing effective engagement below the radar in the region and, and particularly in this context we're talking about intersection of strategic interests. Uh, having been responsible for relationships with, uh, with uh, basing states and the like when I was in strategy group and had the Middle East desk, I can tell you that not in one conversation I ever had with those interlocutors did the issue of Israel ever come up. Uh, their only concern was Iran, and it remains their major concern. And so that alignment of interest now is very powerful, but I also think that states like the UAE, for example, also see a sound economic basis for uh, uh, forming that closer relationship. And I think, you know, we all con continue to see uh, potentially other uh, countries, uh, Arab countries, in the region across North Africa, starting to move in that direction too, as time goes on. Um, as long as the Biden administration continues to understand that there's a US incentive element that really helps that process along as well, and learns the lessons from what worked in that Abraham Accords process. Uh, so that will influence social democratic parties and how they approach uh, the peace process as well, I think. Thank you for that, Mike. I'd now like to hand over to Ajax Naomi Levine. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Mike. Hope you're well. Um, I just wanted to ask about the proposed free trade agreement that this with Israel that this government has put on the table. And to get your thoughts on that, um, the Trade Minister Dan Tean has put defense and cyber security as a centerpiece of any negotiations for that free trade agreement. And I wanted to get your view on what the benefits would be to Australia and what you think the prospects of that sort of free trade agreement would be. Very good question, Naomi, good to see you. Um, and this, is, uh, this comes back to the point I made about economic security. I think uh, Israel has so much to teach a country like ours. I mean, geographically we're huge and we have a lot of mineral resources, but we have a small population. And we can't keep depending on our economic philosophies that we've always had of digging stuff up and selling it overseas and buying back the value of it. Uh, we have to be smarter than that because there are not gonna be jobs enough uh, in relying on that in the future. And we're gonna be dependent on 
what happens with those supply chains. Um, the Chinese are in a very big hurry to get off our thermal coal at the moment. Um, and given the way they're going, of course, we're vulnerable to their approach to trade in general, as we've seen played out. Uh, really the future, I think as COVID has amplified now, is that the technology world is, is one of the great hopes for providing jobs of the future, as well as meeting our biggest challenges, including in relation to energy transition and climate change and building that new economy. Just as, as one example, and this is something Australia really needs to pay attention to because we don't do this kind of strategic thinking very well. But I look at South Korea, who I've had a lot to do with over the years, as well as Israel. And uh, coming out of COVID, they said, right, let's look, look at what's going, on, what's going on here. Who are the winners and losers? What does this mean? How can we take advantage of it? And out of the bottom of that funnel, they decided they would create a thing called the Korean New Deal. And it, it contains two pillars. They're throwing $100 billion at this. And the first pillar is rapid acceleration of the digitization of the entire South Korean landscape, government, business, agencies, education, regional services, you name it. Rapid acceleration of that process. The second pillar is rapid decarbonization of the economy. So they're out there taking advantage as first movers you know, in that respect, although they have actually been doing quite a bit and they've been involved in emissions trading schemes. But they position themselves very well globally, economically, build these wonderful chai bowls, big companies uh, that uh, have done very well, as well as being an innovative nation. So we could learn from them and Israel uh, from the point of view of how Israel takes advantage of its human resources. Uh, so effectively how they became startup nation was first they had this wonderful culture of disputation and contestability, uh, which no doubt you all see at the table on PESA. Uh, but uh, it is, uh, and a very important part of the culture that has given them the ability to innovate continually uh, and also to uh, reward, to, to, to accept failure, to reward people who attempt to try again from failure. You know, it's all spelled out in a, that great book, Startup Nation, which was written by a friend I served with in Iraq, actually, uh, Dan Senor. Um, so uh, we have a lot to learn from Israel and how they created a a venture capital industry in Israel. They came from a zero start uh, in relation to venture capital and through experimentation of public policy, finally came up with the Yosma policy, which now has made them one of the great global destinations for venture capital. Uh, also the policy of how they turn their tertiary institutions into uh, developing their R&D to be commercialized, to support them their uh, pure research as they call it. So you look at Hebrew University, for example, and the holding company Yusum they created, uh, which earns them like you know a couple of billion dollars uh, every year from their patents and whatnot, um, and how they collaborate with industry and whatnot to uh, commercialise research. We have not done anywhere in anything like that with our tertiary institution as in Australia. Some are slowly evolving that way, like we've seen at Deakin and whatnot. But we could learn an enormous amount uh, from Israel and what it's done in those two spheres and in their ability to innovate and create. Uh, startups through an educated population as well. So one of they, the great things they have going for them there is national service where they take through the Talpiot scheme, the best and brightest out of high school in the, the STEM sciences particularly. And then they spend five years enhancing and adding value to that knowledge and then spread them out through the IDF to specifically look for things that need to be changed and innovated. And then they also become a cohort that moves into the Israeli economy when they leave the IDF that helps drive economic development there. So we need to learn how to make better use of our human resource in Australia, empower them to be in, in the jobs of the future uh, and not get left behind. But we can collaborate with Israel on that. And it's been a great example to see Elbit here in Australia building skills and doing things with us and, uh, and innovating locally as well. So um, that we need to learn a lot of lessons from Israel and South Korea on how to come out of COVID strong um, and how to be position ourselves for the new economies. And I'm really pleased with the company that I'm with now uh, that uh, they are kind of, you know, in that space where it's about managing big data, mastering the explosion of the sensory universe. That's really where it's all going now. And we're not recognising that in either the commercial or the governance space enough uh, and what it means technically. 
Thanks for that, Mike. Fantastic answer. Now I'll hand over to Ajax, Dr. Steve Fleischer. Oh, uh, good evening, Mike. Um, thank you very much. Um, I want to ask about something you've managed a couple of times, the Abraham Accords. Um, as you said, it's uh, strategically, it's changing things. Economically, it's possibly changing things. Um, it's rules building good ties with UAE and some other countries. Um, I want to know if you see an Australian um, opportunity to take advantage of these changes and, and particularly, I mean, it'll shorten the flight time between Australia and Israel, but other things. Um, what, other, what other chances that Australia can take advantage of and how should we do that? Yeah, also a very good question. I think um, our interests in the Middle East have always mainly been, been around agricultural produce and uh, and the markets there, I mentioned the wheat board saga out of the unfortunate um, oil for food aspect, but that highlights that we had very, very strong interests in the Middle East. And there is um, controversial ones too, of course, with the live meat trades and the things like that. But um, uh, I think um, we would be from the, obviously a lot of the uncertainty, destabilization uh, and, and opening up of markets in the region uh, through the removal of tensions and conflict. Uh, that's just a, you know, it obviously it always follows when you bring down and you break down tension and suspicions and, and trade always benefits from that. Uh, one of the most important elements of the international economy is um, the insurance industry. Uh, that is the oil that keeps the global economy going. And this was brought home dramatically to me when we had the Somali pirates pretty much closing down a lot of traffic. Uh, in the Middle East and uh, the impact on insurance was crippling maritime traffic and, uh, and raising the cost of everything. Uh, and you saw that reflected too with the ship that got blocked in the Suez just recently, the Evergreen. Uh, so um, this, is, uh, this is obviously in our general economic interests to, and it's something we can take advantage of too. Uh, you know, I've always wanted us to be more collaborative with Israel, for example, on agri-tech and water technology as well. And, um, you know, that is something that Israel tried to share with the, with the region. And, and, uh, and I've mentioned their, their gas resources. Now they're trying to use that as, a, as an economic peace tool as well to supply energy to their neighbours uh, from those gas fields. So uh, those kind of economic strategies we can, you know, participate in, benefit from, improve our trade we're a trading nation it's really important that we have access to as many markets as possible and uh and obviously to make sure that that trade is as efficient effective and safe as possible so uh, all of that relates uh it's part of this globalization trend that makes us all intersected strategically no matter where we are in the world now Thanks for that, Mike. I'll now uh, go over to the West Coast and hand over to Steve Liblich. Thanks very much, John. Thank you, Mike, for um, your uh, very uh, interesting thoughts. Um, I'd like to also follow up on the reference to the Abraham Accords. Um, and uh, just looking at the Biden administration uh, approach that's emerging, there seems to be um, a much greater emphasis on um, uh, human, uh, human relations, uh, uh, human rights uh, in the relations with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf Kingdoms. And, uh, and we're seeing uh, also a revival or attempted revival of the JCPOA and the prospect of a relaxation of sanctions. Um, sort of a... Uh, uh, going back to Obama era, balance of power approach to the region. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on uh, the strategic impact of those changes to the US foreign policy uh, on the uh, containment of Iran, uh, particularly its use of terrorist proxies, the uh, prospect of nuclearization. Uh, in the short term, we've got uh, the war in Yemen. Uh, and in particular, um, what do you think is the likelihood of um, uh, in, in the in the uh, in the face of these changes, um, what's what's the uh, prospect of um, military action um, to, to prevent Iran from becoming nuclear? Yeah, again, Steve, uh, that's probably the million dollar question at the moment for the Middle East, uh, uh, which has led to the <laughs> Abraham Accords in many ways. So, um, I do think it was a mistake uh, under the, during the Obama administration time 
to enter into agreement, an agreement that I believed was, was flawed in many ways. I really believed uh, it, was, it was very, very supportive of pursuing agreements, but agreements like that in so such an important um, area of security requires absolutely incontrovertible, rigorous um, monitoring regimes, assessment regimes, uh, accountability of uh, compliance, and um, but along with that, we know that Iran at the time was demonstrating a willingness to participate because of the pressure the sanctions regime had brought on Iran. Uh, they were absolutely feeling enormous pain from those sanctions. It was very hard for them to even maintain the operation of their oil refining facilities and the like. Technically, they were just uh, unable to uh, maintain many uh, aspects of their infrastructure and services. Uh, and the population was, the, the tension within the Iranian population was building up significantly. And it's a population that I think we can all appreciate is in a situation where it wouldn't take much to, uh, to spill over into a situation demanding greater change, including potentially regime change. Uh, they're really concerned about the pace of inflation, the economic situation and, uh, and the constraints on, on their rights in, in a, a very large degree. You know, it's, it's quite an under, uh, a, a, an under stream of, uh, of dis, uh, dissatisfaction in Iran. So I think um, taking the pressure off, with releasing the, the pressure of those sanctions was, was flawed. I think you only take that pressure off in reward for a proven compliance outcome. And we know that Iran has never given up its nuclear ambitions throughout all of this, and it's still pursuing it today. So Israel and the US obviously, no doubt, looked at fallback possibilities, and we saw some of those play out. We saw the, uh, the Stuxnet uh, intervention, for example, which destroyed Iranian centrifuges initially. Um, that, of course, then was part of the, uh, I guess, acceleration of the arms race in cyber warfare globally, actually. And we saw then Iran retaliate on oil refineries in Saudi Arabia, uh, the Russians uh, then deploying that in, you know, in Ukraine, taking down grids and interfering with commercial operations and software that destroyed businesses. And then the North Koreans taking on Sony and uh, uh, it just has gone on and on since then. And now, of course, the news today about the, uh, uh, the power issue at Natanz. So um, this has all been driven by the fact of having to look for alternatives uh, to achieving the outcome of stopping Iran progressing to having a nuclear capability, which would be a disaster for the entire region and for the globe. Uh, so if those methods don't achieve the outcome of preventing it completely from happening, then you know, you're left at the end of the day only with um, a potential uh, military strike option, which is not guaranteed of complete success, frankly, you know, in the way that uh, the Iranians have established their facilities. But um, uh, if you want to avoid that, if you wanted to avoid having to go to some form of military option, then you need to come back to uh, the sanctions regime and being frankly hard ass with Iran that you don't accept the deceit, the deception, the lies, uh, the non-compliance and that you have to have a rigorous regime of monitoring and validation and compliance uh, checking to, uh, to see them achieve any uh, relaxation of those sanctions. So we need to revisit that. I don't think you can just say, let's go back to the old agreement. They've come far too far down the uh, progress uh, track on, uh, on developing nuclear weapons. And we have to be very, very hard uh, in our approach to them. And that needs to happen as soon as possible. Thank you, Mike. Now we have hit the hour mark, ladies and gentlemen, but we will take two final questions. I'll now hand over to Gus Lira. Do you hear me? We can, yes. Okay. Hello, Mike. Thanks for your remarks and uh, and for your support. 
Um, <clears throat> I want to ask a, a sort of a general question, which sort of encompasses quite a few of the answers you've already given. Um, the Western world or the world of liberal democracies are um, uh, having a crisis of confidence, I think you could, you could say at the moment. Both the concepts of democracy and freedom are at least under challenge and under debate now, whereas in earlier times, for example, when I was at school, it wouldn't have fallen into anybody's head to, to ask any questions about those things. One of the ways in which this is playing out is the different attitudes that different countries have and different people within countries have to the Middle East and Israel. So for example, one thing that people have often said, Israel is the only free country in the Middle East. Um, why are we supporting, et cetera, et cetera? This argument doesn't carry as much weight. So it's, it's uh, Middle East and Israel in particular is one of the things which is splitting liberal democracies. Another one, and possibly even bigger right now, is their attitude to China, where huge pressure is being applied. I read only yesterday that the Chinese are applying enormous pressure to Germany to toe the line, to fall in with them rather than America. They're posing it as a, as a dichotomy. And um, there's a risk that the whole of Europe might split on, the, on that issue. I just wonder what your thoughts are about this and if you can have a crystal ball and how, how do you think this might play out over the next 30 to 50 years? Uh, thanks very much, Gus. Uh, and that's been something that's pre been preoccupying me a, a lot in the last few years, um, particularly sitting on the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security and monitoring a lot of dynamics that are taking place that are causing this. And I think there's a couple of things there if we step back a bit. I think after the, the Second World War, we all believed there was this inevitable trajectory of enlightenment and, uh, and democratic joy spreading across the planet and that education would continually improve. And uh, so we would have better informed democracies that would make great decisions and, uh, and it would all be wonderful and we'd have in, you know, tremendously high quality debate, <laughs> etc. And I think what we found is that that ain't uh, an inevitable trajectory. <laughs> um, and that democracy and its progress is something we have to fight for every day and every hour of every day. And similarly, you know, uh, one of the things I noticed in all my deployments where we all came in and we were, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna have an election and we're gonna set up this institution and we're gonna write this law. And that was all well and good. You know, and in Iraq, we did all of that. Um, but the thing is that I learned was that as much as those things are important to have the structures, the, the legislation, uh, the frameworks, uh, you need a culture of democracy before you have anything that works as a, as a democracy. Like a, one thing I understood about our parliament house was that you could bring that place to a grinding halt very quickly. If people didn't respect a certain basic level of how you should behave in a democratic institution. Um, so how do you build a, a, a democratic culture, um, particularly in places where there's been no such thing, you know, and it's been exactly the opposite. Um, and that's just a long, slow grind, but it starts with education of the kids, to, to be frank, you know, that's, and, and what we've seen, I think that's been a big factor. I've talked a lot about the Russian efforts in uh, uh, in creating this massive wave of misinformation uh, because everybody gets their information now from Facebook rather than credible, you know, genuine journalists who do sound research and, and investigation. Um, that's kind of disappearing from that information landscape now. So everybody's getting self-selecting information. A lot of it's bull, bull crap. Uh, and some of it is actually manipulated by foreign intelligence to create a certain outcome like the Russians have done. And if you want to see the extent of that, it's, it's probably very instructive if you go and have a read of the four US Senate Intelligence Committee reports on the interference in the US 2016 election. So the threat we face is how do we actually restore quality 
to the flow of information in our democracies. And it doesn't help when you get um, media concentration, frankly, either. You know, diverse sort of source of sources of media are important for a quality democracy, but also the journalism that can be supported economically, that can do the research and, and the investigation, and that operates to standards. Um, and so, and education is a really big part of this now. So we have to be teaching our kids how to be discriminating in what they see. Um, they really do need to have in their curriculum time spent on what they're going to be seeing in social media and, and how to discern what is misinformation and what isn't and how to check it, you know, because knowledge is going to be an easily accessible thing out there and it will change all the time. So what the skills they need to learn in school is more analytical skills and how to um, present uh, analysis. Uh, so that's the thing that's going to be constant. Uh, right now, you leave an educational institution, you're probably need, going to need to go back there within 12 months or 24 months, whatever, to upgrade your skills and your knowledge. Um, so that's the biggest single tool they need to be given to navigate this world. And we need to actually do something about that. We need to technically work out ways of improving the quality of the information flow and preventing the involvement of foreign intelligence services and to eliminate these right-wing extremists and Islamist extremists and the like. Filtering content is important. You know, as much as free speech is, uh, free speech um, has limits, as we know. That's why we've all been so keen to defend Section 18C. Um, it's, a, it's a statement of values as well. And statements of values are as important as, as any other part of, of the quality of a democracy that we all sign up to. So. It's a, and we've got to look at the way our democracies operate in eliminating the perversion of political contributions and finance in that space as well. And the control and the, and the growth of some of these massive global corporations, the big tech companies who are in fact adopting their own public policy directions in many ways. Some of them out of the best of intentions, but not strapped to any kind of a political or policy process. And in addition to that, the massive gulf that's developing in many places between the extreme wealth and extreme poverty. And you look particularly the United States in that respect. The Russians couldn't have done anything without the fault lines that have been developing in, you know, in US society in general. And if you don't address those things and act, equitable access to good education, uh, you know, you gonna, that will be the end of, of your strength and your power in the world effectively. If there's anything that will undermine the US, it will be that growing gulf and the failure to get good access to education for the broader community. Just seeing the legions of people sleeping under tarpaulins in Oakland on my last trip to the US for the West Coast Leadership Dialogue uh, just really brought it home to me in a big way. Uh, so, you know, that's what gave birth to, to the Trump effect, frankly. So uh, that hasn't gone away. You know, there'll be someone who will be trying to cash in on that, that Trump base in the future who may be smarter and better at this. Uh, so, you know, we've got a lot of work to do and it will involve everybody doing everything they can every day to hold people accountable and to, to look for the measures that need to be taken. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you, Gus, for that question. Final question for tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll hand over to Ajax Jeremy Jones. Thank you, Mike. It's great to see you. And thank you. You've given us a feast of information. But we've found, I also have to ask for the dessert a little bit extra. Uh, there have been many questions sent in to us, and I'm going to try and uh, synthesize them into uh, one big question for you. The question about understanding how well our policymakers and Australians, in your understand, in your opinion, understand certain issues. You mentioned Iran. You spoke about the issue of Iran as being a big threat, Iran being a global threat much more serious uh, than is often seen or understood when people think of Israel as a Middle East worry rather than Iran. It's a bit upside down. How well is Iran understood by Australian policymakers and also the way it operates groups such as Hezbollah? When you look at the way we've dealt with Hezbollah prescribing part of it, but not the important parts of it as we would think, to me suggest that 
maybe there's not a great understanding of Iran and the threat it sends through proxy. Then we go to anti-Semitism. There's the issue of policymakers, people involved for many years in trying to protect Jewish community, who worry about the safety of Jews, developed a working definition of anti-Semitism, known as the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, which is designed to help people who want to address anti-Semitism understand what it is so that they can therefore res respond to it, where it might come up, how it might be expressed in contemporary circumstances. How well do you think Australians and Australian policymakers understand anti-Semitism and know what might need to be done? And the third issue relates to understanding of terrorism. We recently had the announcement that Australia is looking at religiously motivated and ideologically motivated violence as definitions of terrorism. Uh, I know there's been debate in the public arena about what is the best way to define the terrorist threat to help us deal with the terrorist threat. How well do you think the responsible members of our governments understand the terrorist threats to Australia and how well prepared they are to do them? Yeah, Jeremy. Um... It, it, this is one of the main reasons why I've been such a, a passionate supporter for Israel because I, I just get incredibly offended by this focus on on Israel of all places. You know, um, when I think of and look, you know, if you were going to do a BDS campaign against Israel, then you'd also be asking the world to have a BDS cam campaign against Australia. Uh, you know, what about? Manus and Nauru? What about the Dondale Centre in the Northern Territory? What about Aboriginal deaths in custody? What about the fact that we had a genocide here against the Indigenous people? And uh, what are you going to walk out of your home, which was on Aboriginal land, and give it back to them? You know, like, look at the rafter in your own eye before you look at the splinter in someone else's for a start. And then you have to ask, why has there been this obsession with Israel, this tiny place? And I often, when I have these conversations with people about Israel, I often point out to them, hey, do you know that Israel is half the size of Eden Monero, uh, the district that I represented? You know, do you really think <laughs> that we are giving the right proportion to this discussion when, are you watching what's going on with the Uyghurs in China right now? You know, uh, of the hundreds of thousands who were slaughtered in Syria, that did, that, did that not bother you at all? I mean, if you were worried about the persecution of Muslims, for example, you know, wouldn't you be particularly concerned about these things? Um, why is it you're obsessed with this issue? Why? And, you know, and when we look at it, um, you know, the, 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 the facts of the matter, you know, just speak for themselves. If you look at things like the Human Rights Watch report on the torture and repression in, in the Gaza Strip and, and the PA area, and you line up with countries that have horrendous human rights records, how can you do that in all conscience, you know, uh, and just turn a blind eye to these things? And to me, it kind of has to come back to anti-Semitism in that context, right? So Israel to me is kind of like a bit of a, a the, the proving ground for your attitudes about anti-Semitism. I think if you ask people here in Australia what anti-Semitism, they'll say, oh, well, you don't, you know, sort of persecute or kill Jews. You know, you don't do that because that's anti-Semitism. Well, okay, uh, maybe it's a bit more than that. Maybe it's about understanding why people have the attitudes to Israel that they do. Where does that come from? Um, why is it that you can't accept that there'd be one home for the Jewish people in the world after all the experiences of centuries uh, that you've effectively been a part of culturally? You've inherited a lot of that. Uh, if you're a Christian, don't you think, you know, as a Christian, it's up to you to actually make amends for centuries of, of slaughter and torture and lies, you know, uh, and protocols of elders design and all of these things. So um, it's been something that has bubbled up culturally over many, many centuries, of course, with uh, the way things have been portrayed. Um, and there's been a bit of an awakening, I think, in some groups that are more fair minded to try and correct that. But if you still see these attitudes being played out to Israel, you know that we've still got a long way to go. And that's in the public policy space where I see 
there's clearly not an understanding of what anti-Semitism is because if you understand that the Arab, Israeli Arabs have more rights in Israel than they have than Arabs have in any other part of the Middle East, and uh, and that you've now got a political discussion going on in Israel where parties are talking about maybe forming an alliance with uh, Ra'am and Islamist Party, uh, and well, what are the hang on? They're in the Knesset. Oh, you know, how many Indigenous people do we have in the Australian Parliament? You know. Um, compared to the, one of the largest political blocks in the Knesset is the, the Arab bloc. Um, so, you know, just not to understand all of these dimensions have no uh, factual understanding, but have formed opinions about it. You know, that's the thing that offends me the most. And, uh, you know, I often ask, uh, you know, if you're so obsessed with this, how about you really examine why that is? Uh, in your heart, uh, as opposed to all of the greater global interests and Australian national interests that uh, we really need to be focusing on. And uh, Israel's probably the last place we should be, <laughs> that should be attracting this provider, frankly. Uh, so, and I've said as much to colleagues, you know, uh, when they've tried to isolate this issue in the political space, but uh, what you do about that is we just have to, again, be relentless in our intent to challenge lies and misinformation. And uh, and one of the reasons why there was an alternative motion drafted for that conference was to set out these factors of considerations to educate people. You, a lot of them, you talk to a colleague and they won't know that they don't allow free trade unionism in the Gaza Strip, for example. You know, if you're a trade unionist, uh, you know, if you're, uh, you know, a Labor Party, then that ought to be of concern to you. <laughs> so, Continuing that battle of education is important, but I think it's going to get a bit easier as we take oil out of the equation internationally. And I think that's been part of the Abraham Accords and, uh, you know, the, the beholdens of the world to that oil weapon, which was really born after the Yom Kippur War, uh, using that as a weapon really forced a completely different casting of Israel. You know, for a long, long time, Israel was the darling of the left, for example. You know, a country founded by, you know, sort of socialists, effectively, with the, the most successful form of collective living in the kibbutz movement, which I had the good pleasure and privilege to have, uh, to have lived on the En Harod Me'ohad up in uh, northern Israel. Um, you know, so it was only after the oil weapon was deployed that things really started to get distorted and people adopted policy that just kept them in a sounder economic situation and kept them... Uh, I guess, less vulnerable to terrorism as well as that came along uh, in the uh, 60s and 70s. So with that sort of pressure being steadily released now at the United States, for example, not beholden to Middle East oil, um, that uh, close relationship in between the House of Saud and, um, and various US administrations is, is changing in nature and Saudi Arabia has had to start changing its attitude to may well be one of the next countries that uh, joins that Abraham process. So, you know, I can see some positive signs out there, but by no means are we anywhere near uh, winning that battle. We've got a long way to go. And it reminds me very much of the uh, uh, phrase by Rabbi Tarfon, who said that um, you're not obligated to complete the task of perfecting the world, but neither are you permitted to resolve from it. So. We just have to keep passing our torch along the line. Thank you very much for that, Mike. And ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of tonight's webinar on behalf of AJAC. Thank you so much, Mike, for the presentation tonight. It truly was fantastic. There was a lot covered there, a lot of uh, ins and outs and snippets to take home with us. And I really thank you on behalf of AJAC for, again, a wonderful presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, our next webinar will be a morning breakfast webinar at 8 a.m. in the morning with David Schenker from the United States. It is truly not to be missed. You will find an invitation in your inbox uh, towards the end of the week and registrations are open for David Schenker on the morning of the 28th of April. That's a Wednesday morning. Uh, that's it for us for now. Uh, until next time, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And again, thank you, Mike. And we will see you next time. Thank you.